A serial rapist strikes in a suburb outside Toronto, Canada. The nature of the beatings, what the victims had endured, um, clearly told us that we're dealing with a sexually sadistic offender. Years later, a serial killer brutally targets young girls in another Canadian town. It was gruesome. Who could kill a young teenage girl and dismember her body? Fear sweeps across southern Ontario. The bloody trail leads police to a pair of unlikely suspects, a young, beautiful married couple. The idea that these were the bad guys, that they were capable of doing anything so vile, is something that's hard for us to comprehend. She assaulted her sister. It was absolutely mind-boggling. It's the most sensational and probably one of the most sinister cases in Canadian history. Saturday, June 29th, 1991, at a quiet recreational area near the town of St. Catharines in Ontario, Canada, some fishermen make a horrifying discovery. At one end of Lake Gibson, they notice several concrete blocks partially submerged in the water. They take a closer look and are shocked to find what appear to be pieces of human flesh protruding from the cracks. Niagara Regional Police search the murky waters for more clues. They find a total of eight concrete blocks. Each contains body parts. We believe the party to be a female, young female. It could be between 14 to 24 years of age. The victim is identified as 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey from the nearby town of Burlington. She had been missing for two weeks. The same day her body is found, a young couple exchange wedding vows 16 miles away in the quaint town of Niagara on the lake. Their fairy tale wedding is complete with a horse drawn carriage. At face value, it was a beautiful wedding, but uh, if you talk to the friends and the relatives, uh, everybody knew that it was just a big charade. 21 year old Carla Homolka and 26 year old Paul Bernardo appear to be the perfect couple, but friends and family suspect Paul has been unfaithful. What they don't know is far worse. April 16th, 1992. Less than a year after Paul and Carla's wedding, 15-year-old Kristen French goes missing from her hometown of St. Catharines. Two weeks later, on April 30th, 1992, Kristen's parents' worst fears are realized. A man searching for scrap metal finds the body of their daughter in a ditch on the side of the road in Burlington. Kristen had been sexually assaulted, beaten, and strangled. Her body was dumped less than a quarter mile away from the cemetery where Leslie Mahaffey was buried a year earlier. Police consult with FBI profiler Greg McCrary. They suspect there may be a connection between the two young murder victims. Those crimes are very unusual. To abduct and murder young women and there was a sort of a polarization here. One was abducted in Burlington and the body was in St. Catharines. The other was abducted in St. Catharines and the body was found in Burlington. It sort of connected the crimes geographically at that point. The location of the bodies and the viciousness of the attacks lead police to suspect this is the work of an experienced killer. This was no kid that was just starting a criminal career. This is somebody who had developed a degree of criminal sophistication over the years. Police also believe the culprit may have an accomplice after eyewitnesses report seeing the victim talking to two people just before she disappeared. What no one could imagine is that police would eventually tie the crimes to these seemingly innocent, beautiful newlyweds. They were attractive looking, they were intelligent, they were in love. The idea that these were the, the bad guys, that they were capable of doing anything so vile is something that's hard for us to comprehend. Paul and Carla would be linked to not only the murders of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French, but also the killing of Carla's own sister and the rapes of more than a dozen other women in southern Ontario. Their story would generate headlines around the world about the systematic failure of police to catch them and the couple's intense obsession with each other. 
When Carla Homolka first met Paul Bernardo, she was a 17-year-old high school student who worked part-time at a pet store. He was 23, training to be an accountant, and would soon graduate from the University of Toronto. October 17, 1987, Carla is attending a pet food convention in the town of Scarborough, outside of Toronto. She and a co-worker are having a late night snack in a hotel restaurant when Paul walks in. As soon as Paul Bernardo walked in the door and laid eyes on Carla Hamalka, there was, as the friends describe it, there was electricity in the air. It was uh, love at first sight or lust at first sight, whatever you want to call it. Paul stands over six feet tall with boyish good looks and captivating charm. Carla is immediately attracted to his handsome appearance and his outgoing personality. Within hours, they are in her hotel room having sex. My sense is that Carla was extremely insecure and was looking for a strong man. Their intense attraction will eventually spiral out of control with horrific consequences. They call it a, a match made in heaven, but in this case, it was clearly a match made in hell. October 1987, when 17-year-old Carla Homolka first met Paul Bernardo in Scarborough, Ontario, it was lust at first sight. Carla believed 23-year-old Paul was the man of her dreams. But he was a man with dark secrets, and she was a young woman who would do anything for him. The oldest of three daughters, Carla Homolka was a popular and pretty girl. She grew up in St. Catharines on the southern shore of Lake Ontario. In high school, Carla had several boyfriends, but no one like Paul Bernardo. He was six years her senior, and in her mind, the perfect catch. She bragged to friends about his maturity and good looks. And Paul was quite taken with Carla, too. It was a perfect match for Bernardo. He'd found his soulmate. He'd found the woman who would do anything. And ultimately, she did do anything. The youngest of three children, Paul was a good-looking boy with dimples and a sweet smile. But behind the happy expression was a little boy who had a difficult childhood. His mother was verbally abusive. His father, Paul discovered, was not his biological parent. This startling revelation occurred when Paul was 16. Around that time, Paul began peeking through his female neighbor's windows as they undressed. As he grew older, Paul's curiosity slowly escalated into something more aggressive. It would appear there's something very different in terms of his sexual makeup. From what I can glean, he wasn't necessarily a man who was terribly aroused by consenting sexual activity. Paul Bernardo tried to keep those sexual tendencies hidden. In September of 1983, he began taking classes at the University of Toronto at Scarborough. By all accounts, he was well-liked by friends and neighbors. One of the most horrifying things is that they, he seems so normal. I believe that this is quite common in his psychopathic personalities. They are often very charming, entertaining, life of the party kind of people. He had several girlfriends in college who said they broke up with him when their sexual relationships became abusive. He became uh, fixated almost on, on violence towards women and on c conquering women, on uh, going to, to discos and bars and getting them and having sex with them and getting them to do whatever he wanted. In the spring of 1988, a sexual predator was roaming the streets of Scarborough. By May, there were already seven attacks on women. We're supposed to warn women not to travel alone at night. The attacker would grab women as they got off the bus or walked through the park, pulling them behind bushes where he sexually assaulted them. Early on, these attacks consisted of fondling, but over a 13-month period, the assaults grew more violent. The media dubbed the attacker the Scarborough Rapist. Women were forced to perform intercourse, oral sex, and sodomy, and were sometimes beaten. Everybody knew about the Scarborough rapist. Everybody was on their guard. And uh, it was a nightmare for many young women. And uh, it was a real nightmare for the women who, uh, unfortunately, happened to be pounced on by him. The Metropolitan Toronto Police Department took statements from the victims. But they couldn't get an accurate description 
The women had been attacked from behind and didn't clearly see his face. All they could tell was that he was young and good looking with light colored hair. Police found another common characteristic among the attacks. The attacker forced the victims to call themselves degrading names, such as slut. Nobody had a clue who the Scarborough rapist was. The Toronto police were working diligently on the case. They'd taken as many as, I believe, 100 uh, DNA samples from potential suspects. In the fall of 1988, the Toronto police called an FBI profiler, Greg McCrary, to assist in the search for the Scarborough rapist. Over the next several months, McCrary analyzed police reports and was able to link four more attacks to the Scarborough rapist, bringing the number up to 11. This was a very dangerous subtype of rapist. It was a very anger-based, perhaps even sadistic in nature. Uh, they're rare, but they're very, very dangerous uh, uh, offenders. McCrary's concerns grew as the assaults became more serious. Not only were these women being brutalized, but we felt we were on the verge of perhaps this thing moving over the line into, uh, uh, into homicide, and that's what had everybody's attention. When one sees a serial rapist, there is a high probability that they're being driven by a sexual drive that's been misdirected and that they are going to continue to be driven in that fashion unless we intervene uh, through, through catching them. Special Agent McCrary developed a description of someone he thought police should be looking for. We felt this was more of a high-functioning, intelligent, psychopathic, sexually sadistic sort of offender. I think he lives in the Scarborough area in a dependent situation, probably with uh, family members. Early 20s, uh, has a violent uh, relationship with women, even women that he's in a relationship with. When Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamalka first met in the fall of 1987, there had already been three attacks linked to the Scarborough rapist. Carla never suspected the man she was falling in love with could be linked to such brutal crimes. At first, Paul Bernardo showered her with flowers, with, with gifts, and, and treated her really well. He was a considerate person. He was a considerate uh, lover. Uh, he was uh, a nice guy. And she flaunted him something fierce. Paul and Carla's relationship quickly intensified, both physically and emotionally. Over the next year and a half, Paul drove to St. Catharines to visit Carla several times a week, an 80-mile trip. Her family adored him and wasn't concerned with their six-year age difference. Like 19-year-old Carla, her parents thought Paul was a perfect catch. In the spring of 1989, Carla graduated from high school. By the fall of that year, Carla was telling friends that Paul had been verbally abusing her, but she was always quick to forgive him. That December, Paul and Carla took a romantic trip to Niagara Falls. There, he asked her to marry him. She eagerly accepted. To her parents, he seemed like an excellent choice for a husband. He was good looking. He had ambitions to be a rap singer. He had been trained as an accountant, had a degree from the University of Toronto. Certainly he had all the credentials to be a dream son-in-law. They set a wedding date for the spring of 1991. May 29, 1990, police released a composite sketch of the Scarborough rapist to the media. The composite sketch came out about the time we were doing the, the profile. One of the victims got a pretty good look. When the sketch was released, friends of Paul Bernardo were stunned by what they saw. Paul Bernardo's best friends had in fact contacted Toronto Police and said, this artist's concept is a ringer for Paul Bernardo. During the summer of 1990, a serial rapist is terrorizing the Toronto suburb of Scarborough. Police release a composite sketch of the suspect. Metropolitan Toronto Police stations are flooded with calls. The man accused of more than a dozen sexual assaults in the Scarborough area bears a strong resemblance to Paul Bernardo. By November of 1990, several people, including Bernardo's own friends, have given his name to police after seeing the composite sketch. Police bring him in for questioning and request a DNA sample. The sample is sent to the Center of Forensic Sciences in Toronto, where it is put on a shelf with hundreds of other samples waiting for testing. 
keep in mind that DNA still, even at that time, was relatively new. It isn't what it is today. There's all sorts of different technology today that we can get DNA readings very, very quickly. Around the time of Paul's questioning by police, he moves from Scarborough to St. Catharines. He and his fiance, Carla Homolka, live with her parents until they can get a place of their own. The sexual assaults in Scarborough suddenly stop, but a rash of incidents begin to occur in the St. Catharines area. Carla and her family never suspect Paul. They adore him, especially Carla's 15-year-old sister, Tammy, who looks up to him as a big brother. But soon she becomes the target of his deviant urges. Secretly, if he wasn't just the, the brother that she'd never had, he was also, uh, uh, you know, ogling her and salivating over her, and she was the virgin that Carla wasn't. Paul begins to pressure Carla for the one thing she's unable to give him. While Carla wasn't a virgin, the closest person to her who was a virgin was her youngest sister, Tammy. Desperately wanting to please Paul, Carla agrees to drug her younger sister so Paul can have sex with her. Part of her reasoning is that she'll give him Tammy's virginity in place of her own. It will be Carla's Christmas present to her fiance. December 23rd, 1990. After the rest of the Homolka family goes to bed, Paul and Carla invite Tammy to stay up late and have a few cocktails. What Tammy doesn't know is her drinks are laced with sleeping pills purchased by Carla. She used an animal tranquilizer in order to keep her uh, sedated while the two of them uh, participated in this uh, rape. Carla uses another drug stolen from the veterinary clinic where she works to keep her sister unconscious. She soaks a rag with the drug halothane and keeps it over her sister's face while Paul rapes the young girl. They videotape the entire episode. All this happens while the rest of the family is asleep upstairs. Most people videotape their family holidays and their, their children's first, their second, third, and, and so on, uh, birthday. But he liked to videotape, in his eyes, his sexual contrast. Paul then orders Carla to assault her own sister. On videotape, Paul rapes her, and so does Carla have um, sex with her own sister. But the plan turns deadly. After Carla rapes her sister, Tammy begins to vomit and chokes. Paul and Carla quickly dress her, hide the camera, and call 911. When paramedics arrive, the couple says they had tried to revive Tammy after she passed out from drinking. Tammy is taken to the hospital, where in the early hours of Christmas Eve, she is pronounced dead. It never crossed anybody's mind that her own sister had participated in the killing. Although doctors find a mysterious burn mark on Tammy's face, where Carla held the halothane-soaked rag, they conclude that she died of natural causes. Paul and Carla claim the mark as a rug burn caused by their attempt to revive Tammy. Carla's parents view the death of their youngest child as a tragic accident, something that could happen to any teenager. Everybody kind of took it at face value, so to speak, and uh, wow, accidental death. Kids do drugs, kids drink. Um, how unfortunate, how tragic. A month later, Carla and Paul move out of the Homolka house and into their own home. They move into this two-story bungalow in Port Dalhousie, a small town near St. Catharines. On the outside, they appear to be the perfect couple, but behind closed doors, Paul begins to turn his aggression on Carla. He teases Carla that he is the Scarborough rapist and begins physically abusing her. Any thoughts Carla has of leaving Paul are diminished by her insecurities and fear that he will tell her parents about her involvement in Tammy's death. In this particular case, we have a, a man who is a serial rapist who meets up with a woman who ultimately ends up participating in further acts of sexual abuse and ones that are even far more serious. Paul Bernardo had given a DNA sample to police more than two months earlier, but it still hadn't been tested. Anytime offenders come into contact with the police and they don't end up in handcuffs, they're emboldened. Uh, they think they're better, smarter uh, than the police. June 15, 1991. 
Two weeks before Carla's dream wedding, Paul wakes her up in the middle of the night with a surprise, a young girl, 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey. He had abducted Leslie from her own backyard, luring the teenager into his car with a cigarette. Paul intends to keep Leslie as a sex slave, but her true fate will be far worse than anyone could imagine. June 15, 1991, Port Dalhousie, Ontario. In the middle of the night, Paul Bernardo wakes up his fiancée, Carla Hamolka, with a surprise. With him is 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey, a young girl whom he abducted and intends to keep as a sex slave. Together, the couple holds the young girl captive in their home, repeatedly assaulting her, all the while recording the attacks on videotape. After less than 24 hours, they strangle her, then cut up her body and encase the pieces in concrete blocks before dumping them in nearby Lake Gibson. It is two weeks before their wedding. Well, clearly the relationship between Paul and Carla was a very destructive one. These are two people that fed into one another and encouraged and supported one another would appear in doing things that were just, um, in some sense, unspeakable. On June 29, 1991, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka exchange wedding vows before more than 100 friends and family members. On the same day as their fairy tale wedding, fishermen discover the dismembered body of 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey encased in concrete blocks. The details of the young girl's murder send shockwaves through the region. It was gruesome. I mean, when you, when you imagine not only who could kill a young teenage girl, but who could dismember her body, and dispose of it in such a, an ugly and, and heinous way. There was this massive veil of fear right across southern Ontario. Over the next year, the Niagara Regional Police attempt to find any clues that will lead them to the killer of the teenager. They call in FBI profiler Greg McCrary to assist with the search. McCrary had been asked to help with the Scarborough rapist case more than two years earlier. But he has no reason to think those rapes are connected to the murder of Leslie Mahaffey. Toronto police also don't make the connection to the rash of incidents in St. Catharines, so that information is not brought to McCrary's attention. I wish I had made that connection. I had no idea there were other rapes going on up there at the time either. Had I known that, I don't know, maybe, maybe that would have clicked for me. While the Niagara Regional Police look for clues to Leslie's murder, Carla Homolka settles into her role as a wife. But she finds that marriage has not quenched her new husband's thirst for virgins. In fact, Paul's deviant sexual demands escalate. After they were married, Paul demanded that Carla get some of her sister of Tommy's best friends around to the house because he wanted to drug them in the same way that they drugged Tammy. Over the next year, Carla entices several young girls into their home. The newlyweds drug and sexually assault the girls. But unlike Carla's sister, Tammy, these girls survive, regaining consciousness with no memory of the assaults. Some of these attacks are videotaped. He was uh, obsessed with making himself into a star. It was very important for him to keep trophies or mementos that would confirm uh, how uh, uh, successful he had been on these occasions. With Carla's knowledge, Paul also continues to stalk women throughout the Niagara region. On April 16, 1992, Paul and Carla take an afternoon drive with the intent of bringing home a new sex slave. They are only a few miles from their own house when the couple spots 15-year-old Kristen French walking home from school. They turn into a church parking lot and wait for the girl to pass by. Carla was sitting in the passenger seat of uh, Paul's Nissan and uh, she, she said to Kristen French, excuse me, could you help us with directions? And she had a map out and poor Kristen had no idea what was about to happen to her. The couple shoves Kristen into the car and drives the short distance back to their Port Dalhousie home. It is not long before Kristen French is reported missing. 
local police begin to investigate. We have no doubt from eyewitnesses that uh, Kristen was, ab was abducted from that parking lot. Witnesses tell police they saw the girl with two people in the church parking lot. They also report seeing the three drive away in a beige Camaro. In response to public fear about an attacker on the prowl, the Niagara Regional Police put together a team of investigators called the Green Ribbon Task Force. They examine eyewitness accounts about a beige Camaro and reconnect with Special Agent Greg McCrary. It was a big hunt for this beige Camaro. Eyewitnesses were rock solid about seeing this beige Camaro. Police do not know at the time that this is a false lead. Paul Bernardo drives a gold Nissan. It's always a dilemma for law enforcement because we know eyewitness identification. It's been shown time and time again to be faulty. But you've got people witnessing the abduction and describing the car. You've got to go look for that car. The media begin to link the disappearance of Kristen French with that of Leslie Mahaffey one year earlier. I'd been a reporter for maybe uh, 15 years at the time, and I, all of my instinct, all of my uh, experience told me that this was really bad, that this was going to be a, a major, major story. Kristen's father appears at a press conference, offering hopeful words to his only daughter, should she be watching. You want to know that we are thinking of you and that everything can be done is being done and we'll get you back real quick. Greg McCrary develops a profile of the suspect. I described him as being a white male in his late 20s, um, probably with a history of sexually violent crimes, a history of domestic violence. He would beat his domestic partners. Based on eyewitness reports that there were two offenders, McCrary hopes that maybe he can get through to one of them. If we can drive a wedge in between them, is likely to be a falling out, and we would like to very much be able to facilitate that. Paul and Carla keep Kristen French for several days, raping, sodomizing, and beating her. They videotape the assault to add to their collection. Finally, they strangle her. On April 30th, 1992, Kristen's body is found. Paul Bernardo has left the body of the St. Catherine's teen more than 30 miles away in the neighboring town of Burlington. Her body is discovered in a ditch near the cemetery where Leslie Mahaffey was laid to rest. While authorities attempt to link the two cases, local media feed the public's hunger. I mean, we covered it extensively, probably more than any other paper, but there was an audience and an appetite for that. As the hunt for a possible serial killer monopolizes the news, Paul and Carla's relationship becomes even more violent. In January 1993, a severe beating at the hands of Paul sends Carla to the emergency room. Around the same time, the DNA samples collected more than two years earlier in the Scarborough rapist case are finally processed. After sorting through hundreds of samples, Paul Bernardo is identified as the man responsible for the Scarborough rapes. He is now living 80 miles away in Port Dalhousie, where Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey were murdered. That was a moment where I was both excited and frustrated. They had identified Paul Bernardo now as being the Scarborough rapist. And then he had moved into this area and it became prime suspect, I mean, number one suspect in this case. Bernardo had been identified and questioned based on a composite sketch of the Scarborough rapist more than two years earlier. At that time, he had also given a sample of his DNA. I think he was more brazen and more aggressive than ever, thinking that for whatever reason he'd beaten the system. After investigators connect the three cases, Reporter Alan Cairns gets the police tip of a lifetime. The guy said, uh, pull your Scarborough rapist files. And I remember, now, no, 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 it's, it's the Kristen French murder. And uh, the Leslie Mahaffey murder, he said, pull your Scarborough rapist guy files. It's the same guy. And I was stunned. Huge, huge story.
January 1993, Port Dalhousie, Ontario. Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka get into a violent fight, landing her in the hospital with severe injuries. Paul had attacked Carla with a flashlight, leaving her with two black eyes, a broken rib, and severe bruising. After less than two years of marriage, she decides to move out. Around that same time, Toronto police contact Carla to discuss the DNA results of the Scarborough rapist case. After more than a two-year delay, officials have identified her husband, Paul Bernardo, as the Scarborough rapist. Police suspect there may be some connection to the murders of Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey, but have few leads. To question Carla, they bring along members of the Green Ribbon Task Force, the team investigating the murders of the girls. She thought to interview her about the domestic assault. In my opinion, they handled that interview exactly right because they didn't accuse her, they didn't overstep the bounds, but just by having Green Ribbon Task Force investigators there, that message was being communicated to her. After the interview with authorities, Carla breaks down and confesses everything to her family. She is afraid police already know or are close to discovering the couple's terrible crimes. On her parents' advice, Carla gets an attorney and tells him that Paul is the Scarborough rapist. She also admits to their being involved in the deaths of Leslie Mahaffey, Kristen French, and her own sister, Tammy Homolka. Carla holds the key to putting away one of Canada's most notorious serial rapists and killers. But she will only agree to testify against her husband in exchange for a reduced sentence for herself. Her attorney began to cut a deal. And that, of course, was of tremendous interest, uh, you know, to all the investigators, being able to shed some direct light on these murders and what was going on. Carla makes a full confession to police. She confirms that Paul is the Scarborough rapist, then places complete blame on him for the deaths of all three girls. She says that Paul forced her to be a part of the attacks against her will. Carla also tells them that all the physical proof they need is in the couple's house on video. When it came together, it was the aha moment. It's the, uh, oh yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it makes perfect sense uh, now. Um, that you could see that escalation, the escalation that we dreaded early on in the Scarborough rapes. Word quickly spreads that there has been a break in three of Canada's biggest unsolved criminal cases, the Scarborough rapist and the murders of Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey. Police know they have to move fast before Paul Bernardo tries to make a run for it. February 17, 1993, police arrest Paul Bernardo. Investigators begin searching his Port de Luzi home. I will confirm for you this morning that we have obtained the search warrant. We entered the premise and began our work. During a 71-day search, police cannot find the videotapes, which Carla claims show the attacks on Leslie, Kristen, and Tammy. Carla's word is all prosecutors have to go on if they want to move forward and press charges against Paul Bernardo. Given her extensive knowledge of the crimes and her willingness to testify, Carla's attorney is able to arrange a plea agreement with prosecutors. They made a deal with Carla Homolka because they had no choice. They did not have direct evidence linking Paul Bernardo to the murder victims. In exchange for her testimony against her husband, Carla receives a reduced sentence for her involvement in the murders. The deal is kept secret from the public. June 28, 1993, Carla appears in court to face the charges against her. Although reporters are allowed in the courtroom, they are only allowed to report on the charges and a sentence. This restriction is uncommon in Canadian courts and frustrates many reporters. The publication ban uh, actually spurred the media to write even more about what they didn't know, to write even more about their unanswered questions, and to stir up public indignation about the public right to know being denied. It suddenly dawned on us how big this case was and how, how brutal and how awful and how psychologically twisted this case was. In court, Carla's attorney portrays her as an abused wife 
forced to participate in her husband's criminal activities. Carla is convicted on manslaughter charges stemming from her involvement in the murders of Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey. She receives two 12-year sentences. The terms are to be served concurrently. She had received what everybody thought was um, described as the deal of the century. What she had participated in, though, was not generally known publicly. The light sentence causes widespread speculation about a secret plea agreement. Since her plea was not allowed to be publicized, it was inferred that it must have been a guilty plea. According to the government, the plea agreement and the full facts of the case are being kept secret to ensure a fair trial for Paul Bernardo. The public is divided about being left in the dark. Hear no justice, see no justice, speak no justice. The law's an ass. All we need to know is that justice is served. We don't need to know what the girls went through. Carla Homolka is sent to Kingston Prison for Women. In August of 1993, while in prison, Carla files for divorce. The next time she will see Paul is in court testifying against him. It is then that the full shocking details of the couple's crimes will be made public. The interest in this case was not sparked so much by the brutality of the, of the murders. It was, it was essentially fed by uh, disbelief that such a, an attractive man and such a beautiful young girl could team up and be involved in something so bad. I mean, uh, the Americans coined them uh, Ken and Barbie. And, uh, you know, there was something to be said about that. Ken and Barbie's darkest secrets will soon be revealed when the couple's missing videotapes finally surface. May 18th, 1995, Toronto. It's day one of Paul Bernardo's trial, one of the most anticipated murder trials in Canadian history. People line up for blocks to try and get a seat inside. Scarborough native Paul Bernardo pleads not guilty to nine charges in connection with the deaths of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French, including kidnapping, unlawful confinement, aggravated sexual assault, and murder. His now ex-wife, Carla Homolka, is already doing time in prison for her participation in the crimes. After agreeing to testify against Paul, Carla is serving a 12-year sentence. Inside the courtroom, the day begins with some powerful new evidence for prosecutors. Six videotapes found in the couple's home. That was the first time that they had direct evidence uh, against uh, not only Paul Bernardo, but Carla Homolka. Much to everyone's surprise, the tapes reveal a very different version of events. Carla had misled authorities about her involvement in the crimes. On the videos, she is seen fully participating in the attacks. Had the tapes surfaced earlier, they may have affected her infamous plea deal. The tapes were crucial evidence. They, they were the smoking gun. On one tape, Carla is seen raping her own sister. She assaulted her sister captured on videotape. The idea that one sister would offer up a younger sister as some sort of a present without a gun being held to their head seems bizarre in the extreme. It was absolutely mind-boggling. In court, the defense maintains that any crimes committed by Bernardo stopped short of murder. We had this sort of history to work on and all of his sexual assaults the women had lived. It was only when he was in this very close interaction with, with Carla that they didn't. Paul Bernardo insisted from, um, right from the beginning, and uh, I'm sure does to this day, that he was not the killer and that Carla was. On June 19, 1995, Carla Homolka goes to court to testify against her ex-husband. She tells the court that she is a victim and that Bernardo was the mastermind behind all three murders. On cross-examination, the defense plays the videotapes, which clearly show Carla's participation in the assaults. She uses battered wife syndrome as her explanation, a claim sharply disputed by Paul's attorney. I'm not suggesting for a moment that she was um, um, not abused by him. What I'm saying is that 
um, she could not be classified as a person suffering from a battered spouse syndrome. I think in battered spouse uh, syndrome that we're talking about people having tremendous psychological abuse. As I see it, uh, she was more of an accomplice in these horrible crimes than a victim of these crimes. Paul Bernardo's trial lasts nearly four months. In an effort to spare the families more grief, the judge allows the jury to see the graphic videotapes while the public is allowed to hear only the audio portions. Professionally speaking, I was disappointed that we didn't see the tapes. Personally speaking, I'm glad we didn't see the tapes. The audio reveals Paul Bernardo's modus operandi as used in the Scarborough rape case. He got them to repeat over and over and over again that they'll do anything he wanted, that he's the king. After hearing the testimony of 86 witnesses, the jury of eight men and four women deliberates for eight hours before reaching their verdict. September 1st, 1995. 31-year-old Paul Bernardo is found guilty of all nine charges against him, including two counts of first-degree murder for killing 15-year-old Kristen French and 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey. The parents of both girls are pleased that Paul Bernardo is behind bars, but their nightmare isn't over. Only the trial is over. Leslie is still not coming home. Paul Bernardo was sentenced to life in prison with eligibility for parole in 25 years. After his conviction, he also confesses to the manslaughter of Carla's younger sister, Tammy, and the sexual assaults of 14 other women in the Scarborough area. Those admissions lead the judge to declare him a dangerous offender, meaning he will likely spend the rest of his life in jail without the chance for parole. The controversy sort of rages around, did, was Carla given too light a sentence? Was she, did she get off on this thing, so to speak, get off way too lightly? And that's certainly the opinion of a lot of folks that, uh, that she is. I have my concern that she may be more psychopathic than Paul. Even though Carla Homolka misled authorities about her role in the assaults, prosecutors decide not to challenge the plea agreement. The decision, they say, is final. I'm not a lawyer, but as I understand the law, once the deal was cut in Canada, they had to honor the deal. Carla's plea deal becomes known as one of the worst in Canadian history. The media call it the deal with the devil. The controversy surrounding the Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka crimes does not end with the verdicts. The following year, the Ontario court releases the results of a six-month-long inquiry into the police handling of the Paul Bernardo case. They conclude that the investigation was hampered by numerous mistakes and that Paul Bernardo fell through the cracks simply by moving from one community to another. Since the inquiry, Canadian authorities implemented a new system specifically for tracking serial predators. Their goal is to improve communication among police departments. On July 4th, 2005, 35-year-old Carla is released from prison after serving 12 years behind bars. Although she served her full sentence, some feel that was not long enough for the role she played in the crimes. My personal feeling is she got off light. Um, I think that she has more culpability for this than than she was punished for. Um, but she's out. And uh, so all we can do now is hope that she doesn't harm anyone else. Unable to comfortably return to her hometown of St. Catharines, Carla Homolka decides to start her life over in French-speaking Montreal. She could come out in Quebec, basically an unknown person, and she could get on with her life and uh, become a normal person, and that's exactly what she's tried to do. Carla says she still has nightmares about the girls and feels remorse for what she did. She should be scrutinized. She shouldn't just be allowed to, you know, ride off into the, into the sunset. In February of 2007, less than two years after her release from prison, Carla Homolka gave birth to a baby boy. Carla Homolka has a tough life ahead. Uh, how do you deal with what happened there? And how on earth is she gonna break it to her child? What happened? 
she's out there in the community. And so we all, not only for her sake, but for all of our sakes, have to hope that she's going to do well. From my perspective, um, she had served her sentence. It was, uh, she's entitled to be released and she's entitled to go about her life as best she can. And um, that's the way the system is. Would I want her living next door? No. Oh.